Hey there! Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and welcome to Anfield Index special series, The Next Dance. So in part one, ladies and gents, we looked at the fan favourite, I think it's fair to say, Xabi Alonso. This time, we move into a a manager, a head coach that is split in opinion. Some will claim that it's hipsters just getting fancy. Some will claim his style is well worth appraisal and should be what Liverpool look for as they move into the next stage. So the person we're talking about this time round in part two, ladies and gents, Ruben Amarin, the Sporting Lisbon head coach. And myself, knowing very, very little about Portuguese football, not going to profess to be any type of expert in that, I am delighted to be joined by a second Dave in the form of Mr. Dave Hendrick. How are we, sir? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Looking forward to this one. Yeah, it's an intriguing one. I know he's a favourite of yours, so we're going to get straight into this one. I mean, you'll know, you'll see, you see social media, Dave. You know how all these things work. There's a real split on this guy that some, and I know you're a big fan on him, some will say, Hipster, it's just one of those names that's fashionable at the time. But let's get into real specifics with... Ruben Amarim. I mean, probably the first place to naturally start, his style of play. Mm. What are we talking? What's different to to Jurgen Klopp? What's making his sort of sport and Lisbon team get headlines at the moment? So his style of play is more similar to Jurgen than, say, Xabi Alonso is. His style of play, the shape is is a 3-4-2-1. It's the same shape that Alonso uses. Some might say it's the shape Alonso borrowed from Amram. But his style of play is more similar in that it's a lot more involving build in wide areas. So he will play his his back three, which this season, Diamande, Coates and Inacio, he likes to have Inacio, one of the centre-backs, as a line-breaker in terms of passes. We'll often see that from Virgil. He likes to get his wing backs high and wide and involve them in the build, have them interchange with the two withdrawn forwards, which oftentimes will be Marcus Edwards and Francisco Trinkiel, who will often take the wider roles and his wing backs will come a bit narrow. His central midfield, it's it varies. When they won the league the first year, he had Joe Polina and Mateus Nunes. And they were there to be functional. They were there to eat up ground, to tackle, to pass, to not do anything spectacular. But they were brilliantly effective. Very, very similar to how Jurgen's midfield has worked for Liverpool. He empowers his wing backs to be creative, 
to be aggressive, to be attack minded. I think his style of play and his style of pressing is a lot more similar to Liverpool than the Alonso style. And frankly, I find the hipster shouts to be utterly ridiculous because the most hipster manager in the world right now is Xabi Alonso. True. True. I mean, I, I, I've i seen bits of Amarimo. I've done a, a bit of research and I know you've tweeted it and, and I picked up on this the other day very much. His CV, despite, like say, the hipster shouts, it's not perfect, but it's quite an impressive CV he's got, isn't it, to be fair? Yeah, so he took over as the Braga B manager in September of 2019, managed not, uh, managed them for 11 games, won eight of them, 72.73% win rate, which, you know, I mean, it's again, it's a B team. So you're only there to serve the A team. But still, when your players are getting plucked left, right and centre, to win 70-odd percent of your games is, is impressive. Um, from there... He was given the Braga first team job because um, they decided to make a mid-season change. He he managed them for 13 games and he won 10 of them, which is a 77% win rate. And that was all it took for Sporting to decide he was the one they wanted. And Sporting paid, I believe... 10 million euro to buy him out of his Braga contract Wow! after after just 13 games as the first team manager, which is really, really impressive. Now, prior to that, he had worked with Casapia, who were in the third division, and he didn't have the right licensing to be a manager at that point. He was still undergoing his coaching badges while also... Uh, undergoing a master's degree. So clearly a very intelligent guy, had a good career, not an Alonso level career, but I've seen some people be dismissive of his career. I'm sorry, guy played 14 times for Portugal, played in the Champions League, played nine years at Benfica. That's that's a high level career. That's yeah. a far better career than most people. So when I see people dismiss the career he had, well, I, I'd like to point them in the direction of the playing careers of Jurgen Klopp, Alex Ferguson, Arrigo Sacchi, Jose Mourinho, Arsene Wenger, you know, some of the greatest managers of all time. Yeah. Do you know? So he had a decent career. A very intelligent player, noted for his intelligence. A career that was ruined, it should be pointed out, by injuries. He had serious knee issues as a player. So it wasn't a lack of talent that held him back. It was injuries. But he made it clear he wanted to go into management. He took an early opportunity with Casapia. The whole thing was a, a disaster. Not from him. They won a lot of games. He just didn't have the, the licensing. So what happened was he actually got banned from coaching for a year because it came out that Casapia had appointed him and not done the wow. right checks or whatever. It was their fault, not his, but he got punished. Either way, he managed to get that reduced on um, on appeal, which is how he ends up taking the Braga job later that year. But he goes to Sporting. Now, you have to remember, Sporting are, by a big distance, the number three team in Portugal. Yeah. Benfica and Porto are miles ahead. Sporting have always been the also ran, the afterthought. Sporting have also been the ha ha ha, look at what Sporting Lisbon are doing kind of club. Not long before he went there, fans broke into the training ground and assaulted multiple players because the club was such a mess, which an incident which cost them Rafael Leao and three or four other players who terminated the contracts and left. So it's not as if he walked into a good situation. They were yeah. a mess. So he takes over in March of 2020. Now, it should be pointed out that before he left Braga, he put them in position to win the uh, League Cup. Basically won the League Cup with them. 
in his first full season with Sporting, he wins the League and Cup double. In his second season, he won the Cup again. Didn't win anything last season, but this season, they're currently second in the league, two points behind Benfica with the game in hand. They're through in the um, domestic cup, the, in the league cup, to the semi-finals. They got to the semi-finals of the other domestic cup and were beaten by Braga. And they progressed out of a difficult enough group in the Europa League and therefore will play in the knockout playoffs against young boys. So they're competing across all fronts. This guy has excelled at each level of management that he's had so far. And we have a far bigger sample size of Ruben Amram than we have of Xabi Alonso. Xabi has managed 67 games that matter with Bayer Leverkusen. Amram has managed 204 games that matter with Braga and with Sporting. That's Braga first team, not B team. So you're talking about nearly four times, over three times the amount of games and a league title and three domestic cups. And people can belittle the Portuguese league all they want. It is undeniably the fifth best league in Europe. It is a better, more competitive league than the French league. But people just want to dismiss it because it's not a top five league. It is a top five league. The top five leagues doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't for a couple of years. What this guy is doing is incredible at sporting, where the budget is much smaller, the wage bill is much smaller, and he's also having players sold on him every single year. And that's something I think that people overlook. You look at that title-winning team. Pedro Porro, gone. João Polina, gone. Mateus Nunes, gone. And Nuno Mendes, gone. That's the four across the midfield, all sold. Yeah. Three years later, he has them in a position to win the league again. And in the interim, he developed Manuel Ugarte from a £4 million player into a £65 million player and sold him as well. This guy is an elite player development coach, a proven elite player development coach. Wow, yeah, that is some CV, especially when you start quoting those players as well. I mean, from from what you were saying, he's with the third best club in the league. He's sort of fighting as the underdog. I, I can't pretend I know anything about him personality-wise, and this could be wildly different, but this almost sounds a bit like Rafa Benitez's days, doesn't it, at Valencia and the model he was in where players were being sold as well at, at times or moved on. What do we know about almost his personality, because you know the challenge will be, Dave, will he be bought into, will he be received? Mm. Because there will be that dismissive element. We can't pretend that at all. There will be there will be no dismissive element among the players because players talk to other players. And Diogo Jota, as an example, will have been in Portuguese squads with a number of Amarim's players, and they will have given glowing reports on this guy. This guy... His strongest attribute is his man management. This is Klopp at Dortmund. This is not Rafa at Valencia. This is Klopp at Dortmund. I'm telling you now, this is Jurgen Klopp at Dortmund. His wow. personality, the easygoing creator of the right environment, the guy that connects individually with every one of his players, his players adore him you can find a litany of testimonials from his players online talking about the difference he's made to them as players and as people this guy cares about people this is Jurgen Klopp at Borussia Dortmund whether people want to accept it or not that's who this guy is again much of the dismissal is from the ignorance 
of, oh, I don't know who he is. I don't know anything about Port- Portuguese football. Rather than, can you tell me about him? It's, oh, but I know about Alonso, so it has to be Alonso. This rush to anoint Alonso and completely dismiss Ruben Amram, who is a better, more proven manager in every single area that's worth consideration, other than, did they play for Liverpool? Well, the answer for him is no. But that cannot be the deciding fix, the deciding uh, factor. Was he as good a player as Alonso? No. Again, totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Like, Lothar Mateus is one of the five greatest players of all time. He's a dreadful manager. Dreadful. Diego Maradona might be the best player ever. Really, really not a good manager. Jurgen Klopp was, by his own admission, not a great player at all. Great manager. Do you know? Like, it's not about what they did when, when they were players. It's about what they do as managers. And if we look at Alonso and Amram head to head, who's won more? Amram. Who's more proven? Amram. Who's developed more players? Amram. Who's dealt with more adversity? Amram. Like, what exactly would we point to in Alonso's strength? He might win the league this year. Oh, so might Amram, by the way. So, like, I'm not trying to dis- diminish Xabi at all. If we get Xabi, I will be very happy. What I'm saying is I don't believe he's the best choice for the job. I think this guy is. I think this guy ticks more boxes for us. I think this guy's also a longer-term appointment. My biggest worry with Xabi is you get him, he does three to four years, and then Real Madrid come calling. Yeah. And people will say, oh, well, he won't go. Won't he? Well, he went the last time they called. And also, to me, and this is just me, it's not a great look that 18 months into his first job, he might bolt out the door. That's not a great look to me. Like, I would rather see him give... Now, you can say, look, you can say Amram left Braga after three months. That's fair enough. But... I, I would rather see Xabi do a bit longer at Sporting or at, at Leverkusen before we jump on that. And again, I think he would leave at the first call from Real Madrid. I don't think Amram would. I think Amram would be a long-term appointment. I think he's eight to ten years. And that, again, would go in his favour. But in terms of his personality... He speaks fluent English, which is the first thing to note. There's been some people trying to spread misinformation that he doesn't speak English. He does. He's known to be very personable, very good communication skills, very easygoing, but also not afraid to take a hard line with a player when he needs to. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. (laughs) This is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. And that's important. Like that, that discipline side is important. And there's been examples at 
sporting where he's he's had to take a hard line with players and he's been event, eventually been able to turn them around and bring them back to the group. So, you know, I, I just I every box that I look at, he ticks without question. With Alonso, it's a lot more guesswork. Like we, there's no example yet of a player that Alonso has taken from an academy and developed into a 60 million player and sold and then had to replace. There's multiple examples of Ruben Amram doing that already in a short career. And if you look at the, the current team now, Diamande, they bought him for 8 million. He'll sell for 70. Inacio came through the academy. He'll sell for 55 to 60. They bought Victor Jokerez from Coventry in the summer for 17. He'll be a 70 million pound player by the end of this year. He's He had 34 goal involvements in the entirety of last season in the championship. He has 34 goal involvements in just 28 games this year playing in Portugal. And it's early February. He's going to have 50 goal involvements by the end of the season. That's wow. coaching development. Everyone, and like, this is the, the thing that impressed me the most. Multiple centre-backs have been developed into top-level centre-backs. Multiple wing-backs. A plethora of midfielders, in, including Morton Hillman, who they brought in under the radar in the summer for, I think, 15 million. He'll be a 40 million pound player by this summer. Uh, Pote Concalves was on the scrap heap after Wolves deemed he wasn't good enough. Amram got hold of him, turned him into a 20 goal, 25 goal a season attacker and has now worked him back into central midfield as a controller because Amram is also altering his own style of, of play. And rather than going for just a really physical midfield, he's now got the balance of physicality and control. Marcus Edwards has taken huge strides. Trinkau, people wrote him off after the failed loan at Wolves. Amram got hold of him. He's playing some of the best football of his career. And Jokerez, who's just going from strength to strength week to week. Like, this guy develops players all across the pitch, not just in one area. That's really rare. That's Jurgen Klopp at Borussia Dortmund. Wow. And yeah, there's a there's a heck of a CV there, and some statements, and the, the evidence is there, player wise. And I did want to ask you because you you quoted some names there, no doubt, in his current sporting squad. All of us will have heard about because of the natural transfer links to Liverpool that have gone on for a while with Inacio. That almost goes back to the summer, doesn't it? And Diamande very much been on the radar recently. When a new manager or when a new head coach is to come in, Dave, people will naturally assume they're going to bring these people with them or they're going to go back to their old squad and, and mm. cherry pick a few. Who do you look at? Because I know we talked in, in part one that Javi potentially could make quite a, a few sort of new signings and adjust mm. it in line with the sporting director. Who do you think could be the winners and losers, so to speak, if it was Amarim to come in? Well, you're looking at the same shape, a different style of play in that it's more, a lot of the build-up is more in the wide areas. But I think the winners and losers, you're looking at a lot of the same people. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure Trent would be as much of a winner as under Amram as he would under Alonso, because I, that, my assumption is Alonso would use him as he uses Grimaldo. Whereas I think Amram would use him more as a wing back, like an out and out wing back. I still think he'd get a lot out of him. I still think Trent would play incredible football under him. And yeah. I think he might even break the assist record playing under this fella. But he wouldn't have as much freedom to shift in into midfield. Um I, Diaz would make more sense as one of the two behind the striker in the Amram way of playing than he does in the Alonso way. And Cody might make a little bit less sense in one of those roles. Gravenberg again. Gravenberg definitely isn't going to work in a in a, an Amram midfield pairing. He just isn't. Doesn't work nearly hard enough. The one thing you're going to have to do under this guy is you're going to have to grind. He's he's a more pragmatic manager than a lot of others, but he still has very 
basic principles, which are very similar to Jürgen's, about hard work and commitment and the team coming first. So unless you buy in the whole way, you're, you're going to get bought out. Now, just to give you a quote from Paolo Manises, who's the head of recruitment at Braga, his playing style is clearly pragmatic. He's a studious coach with the capacity for work and a lot of intuition. He is contagious with his will to win. And with that conviction that only hard work from everybody makes that possible. Now, who does that sound like? <laughs> Indeed. Do you know? So he's going to want players that are going to be fully committed and that fully buy in. Again, the three needs for him are the same three as Alonso needs. Now, with him, the left side centre back, again, a must. Whereas Alonso, you could maybe see bringing in Capier. Amram could bring in Ascio. He will want more of a pure number six than Alonso would. Like Alonso wants more of a ball playing six. He has it with Palacios now. I suggested Zubamendi would be ideal. He would want more of a pure six because if you look at who he's had during his time uh, with Sporting, he's had Joe Polina, who's just a pure ball winning monster. Manuel Ugarte, who again is a pure ball winning monster. Yeah. He's got um, Hedimasa Morita, the Japanese international. He's a ball winner. And Morton Hillman, that I mentioned earlier, a pure ball winning monster. So he's going to want that physical ball winner. Now, Hillman would be a good fit without question. Um, someone that we probably should have looked at in the summer. The issue is. Because, because Amram has already had him and he's done so well, Sporting are going to want top, top dollar for him. They're not going to accept anything probably below his buyout clause, which I think is about 80 million. So he, he's probably actually done too well with him and priced him out of a move to Liverpool. The reason Anasio might work is his buyout is a bit lower. I think it's like 55. Um, but someone like Abubakar Kamara would work very well in that role. Um, and maybe he could go, like with Alonso, with Zubimendi, maybe he could go for a former player to fill that left wing back spot in Nuno Mendes, who's not necessarily a first choice player at PSG. He has had some injuries, but Amram managed him really well. And given we'd have Robbo, you wouldn't need to overtax Mendes. Robbo yeah. could play a decent amount, uh, cups and, Euro and some European games and some, some league games and whatever. So, He'd need the same three areas. He'd just have different profiles for what he's looking for. Interesting. And and this one, based on what you've said, I mean, if Amarin's used to his star players being sold most summers and having to develop players, you said, and go again, I'm guessing it might be a straightforward that for the final question, you wouldn't expect him to have any difficulty working with a sporting director or succeeding power to them at all? No, no, no problems at all. Like, look, <clears throat> just to go to go through the years um, that he's been at sporting, we can get his transfer record up. So, 2021 is when they won the league. So, summer of 2020, the only player they bring in because they're broke, remember, is Antonio Adam, the, the goalkeeper, who fairly average. The season before, they'd finished fourth and not come close to winning anything. And with largely the same squad, just a couple of players promoted from the academy and a couple of players brought back from loans, as well as bringing in Pedro Porro on loan and Matthias Rees on loan, they win the League and Cup, right? After that season, they bring in Manuel Ugarte for four million or whatever it was. They finish second. Then after that season, which is the summer of 2022, they sell Nuno Mendes, an academy player, for 38 million euro, João Polina for 20 million euro, Matthias Nunes, who they picked up for like three million the year before Amram got there, they sell him for forty-five million. 
they bring in Ruben Venegra from Wolves, who didn't really work out. Pedro Poro becomes a permanent deal. Uh, Jeremiah St. Just, who's done well there, but has had some injuries. Marita and Trinkiao on loan. They do all of that for roughly 25 million. So they make a huge profit. And yet he continues to keep them competitive. Um, the fo- then last summer, summer just gone, Pedro Porro had left in the January and they sold Manuel Ugart as well as Yusuf Chermeti, who he had been working with for like two years with this kid that was 16 at the time to develop him into his ideal number nine. He gets sold as well. They bring in Yacarez, they make the Trincao deal permanent. They sign Ivan Fresneda, another one that's going to go for massive money. They got him for yeah. $8 million. He'll go for 35 40 easy. And Hillman. So they make a huge profit again, and they've gotten even better again because he continues to replace players and use them really well. Like, <clears throat> you look at this season, he doesn't overplay anybody. Giancarlo Inacio has played the most league games. Um, he's played 17 of their 19 league games. No one else has played that many. Pedro Cancalves has played every every game in the league this year. The only other midfielder that's played uh, a heavy amount is Hulmond. Up front, Jacques has played 18. No one else played more than 14. The starts. No one else started more than 14. Yeah. He's able to balance his squad really well bring players in and out, rest them. Like, you look at who he's playing. Diamande, a kid no one had really heard of when he was at Mitteland. He's pretty much an unknown. Inacio, an academy player. Fresneda, someone they picked up for $9 million. Now, he's had some injuries and it'll take some time, but he still looked really good when he's had his opportunities. Um, Esgeo, the, the right back, he was at Braga. That's where Amram got to know him. He's someone that Amram bought, brought to uh, Sporting. He was a squad player for the first 18 months, you know, playing here and there when needed. Played in some of the Cups, played in some of the European games, but mostly coming off the bench. But when Pedro Porro left, he had a scale ready to just step in. So when they brought bought Fresneda... They didn't need him to come in immediately and make an impact because yeah. Amram had already been working with somebody, more experienced player, as gay as 30, 29, 30. But he had mentored him and developed him into the player he wanted when Pedro Poro moved on so that they didn't have this immediate drop off to a young player. He's done the same thing on the left. I mean, it's been kind of a, a turnover on the left for him, but it doesn't it doesn't matter. Like he just gets the best out of every single player. There's very few players you'd look at at Sporting this season and say, he's not playing well. Like some, it takes a bit longer to get them to the level he wants them at. Yeah. Like when he, when he took over, Eduardo Caresma had long been touted as the next great Portuguese centre-back. Long been touted. Since he was 15, people were hyping this kid up. And Inacio was kind of an afterthought. Inacio hit quicker. So rather than just try and force things with Charisma, he loaned him out a couple of times. But then he'd bring him back in the summers and he'd work with him. He'd bring him back in the winter break and he'd work with him. And now, finally this season, Charisma's getting more opportunities and he's starting to show what he's capable of. He's still young. He's still only 21. But some coaches will just bind him off because he wasn't ready at 18, 19. That's not how this guy works. Every player in that squad is performing at a really high level. And he's not afraid to take a player and play them out of position either. Like uh, Nuno Gomes was there when he took over, was a decent squad player, pretty good attack-minded player, could play in the final third, he often played him in the two behind the one. This season, he's moved him to left wing back. 
He's playing the best football of his career. He's been spectacular from that role. Using him as a playmaker. It's very you could you could close your eyes and picture Trent doing a lot of the same stuff on the right hand side. So he's not afraid to take players and move them. And again, who's that? That's Jurgen. Yeah. I I'm not saying it because he's my preferred favourite. He's my preferred favourite because of this. Because every angle I look at him from, he reminds me of Jurgen. The personality, the very, very basic principles of what he wants from his team. The man management style. The desire to win. The adaptability, the pragmatism, the player development, the track record. Like people can can say, like I've saw I saw some I've seen some, some terrible takes. <clears throat> some fella listed like a bunch of players sporting had over about an eight year run, right? It was like they've always had talent. This was just other managers failing. How, how did they not win titles? Look at who they had. Right. Your ignorance is shining through, folks. The reason they weren't winning titles is because they had two or three really good players and a bunch of crap. Benfica had nine or ten really good players. Porto had nine or ten really good players. And when Sporting got to like the point of having four or five really good players and a bunch of crap, they had to sell one or two of the players because the club was so badly run and they were always in debt. And he's the first guy to go in there in 20 years and win a league title. And if he holds the course this year, he'll win another league title. Like, winning at sporting is really hard because they're really badly run. And yet, him and Hugo Viana, the sporting director, year after year, managed to hold that club together. A club that is, has been at multiple points on the verge of just exploding into oblivion of greedy board members selling everybody because that's what they want to do. And yet these two lads continue to manage to develop players, to find players, to hold on to players and put out a competitive team Against the odds, like I, I cannot explain to people how impressive it is what he's done there. Benfica and Porto are so much more wealthy now, even with their own financial issues, they've always had the ability to go out and just buy players, and they've got much bigger academies that produce far greater quantities of numbers of players to sell. Like Benfica will sell players from their academy who've never played for Benfica for 15 million once or twice a year because yeah. the sheer volume of players that comes through that place. Sporting don't have that luxury. They have to develop players for their own team and then they sell them on. And nobody is doing a better job anywhere at developing players than this guy. Nobody. Wow. Wow. It's been a, an interesting one, folks. This and and even... by the way, he he is perfectly suited and perfectly happy to work in that sporting director um, structure. He's worked seamlessly with Hugo Viana since walking in the door. And if we were being clever, Hugo Viana would be high up on the list of our sporting director tar- targets to just go and get both of them because we know it's a pairing that works. It's his choice, ladies and gents. The sporting director structure, the CV, the player development. It is a very strong case for Ruben Amarim to be Jurgen Klopp's replacement in the near future. I felt it was insightful. I've learned an absolute ton of information. So all it leaves me to say is, Dave, as ever, thanks for the insight, pal, and the take. It was good to get. No problem at all. And ladies and gents, That was part two of The Next Dance. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. 
please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.